All right. We are live. Right. <laughs> yes, you guys may peace for all our viewers in YouTube and also Facebook Live. Mm, Hello, peace. everyone. <laughs> hi, yes, yes. Please say hi. Please say hi. Wave. Oh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> oh, my God. Y'all are so cute. <laughs> so cute. Wow. I think we, we kept the best speakers for the last session. <laughs> oh, don't say that. Make me shy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, maybe while before we, you know, um, we start the session, we can just share about like, um, each of you have your own organizations and it's very interesting that um, each your organization does different purposes regarding sexual health, right? So uh, maybe you can just tell us about how you founded the organization or why you started um, this organization. We can start with uh, Sean and Stephanie from Wonderleaf. Hi, I'm Sean and my, there's my colleague Stephanie right there. You see her? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> we are working for Wonderleaf. So it, we are responsible for the invention of the world's first unisex condom. So our CEO, our inventor, he's a gynecologist for 30 years. So the reason why he created the invented the Wonderly Unisex condom is because he has seen so many uh, people going through a lot of unwanted pregnancies and um, sadly abortions as well. So STDs and everything. So based on his experience, he's trying to figure out what is the best uh, contraception to to. to Help solve this. So that's how we came up. That's how he came up with the one Yeah. Damn. Wow. Yeah, I saw I saw that you know in the news it came out and I was like, how does this work? Mm. Yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh next we have uh Pink Flag, Jovina and Elaine. Ah oh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, actually, Pink Flag isn't founded by Joanna and I. It's actually oh. founded by our high school friend. And she founded it earlier this year during the White Flag movement. And so like she needed help with it and we decided to help out. And that's how we joined Pink Flag. But the reason she founded it was because her and her uni friend were sad to see like a lot of people couldn't afford proper menstrual hygiene products and so they started fundraising and it turned into what it is now wow that is amazing yeah. so is, is it like a student organized like student-led organization or um, like yeah for now, for now it is mostly, it is mostly organ, uh, students but i think one of the co-founders recently graduated so we are moving towards uh, turning it into an NGO. Yeah. Okay. Okay. On, on. All right. Thank you. And lastly, we have Rebecca Lee from Sexual Health. Yes. Hello. Hi. Please pardon the strong wind in my background. The winds are celebrating for us. <laughs> oh, and Rebecca. Oh, that's a wind sound. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh. It's getting stronger here, my, the wind. Uh, I'm Wait. Rebecca. I'm a okay. trainee doctor from Penang General Hospital. Uh, we started the Sexual Health Years project about a year ago after we graduated from medical school. So the co-founder, we had three of us, uh, three medical graduates. So we started because um, during our medical school time, we had a chance to spend time with children. And we realized that many of them have questions about sexuality and sexual health, but they did not get the answer from their teachers nor their parents. And it was shocking to us because the same happened to us during our childhood, which was about 15 to 20 years ago. That means the same gap still existed, even after almost 20 years. So we wanted to do something about it. And we started to see what are the gaps that we can fill in. And we decided to come up with a game. It's a tabletop game to help parents and children initiate sexuality related discussions at home. So we are trying to publish the game very soon. We are in the beta testing phase and hopefully wow. um, parents start to talk about sex to children. Yeah, that's wow. Cool. That's interesting. I'm looking forward to the game. Huh? Okay. Thank you. The wings are silent now. <laughs> oh, see? 
Just in time, it's 5 p.m. sharp. I will uh, pass the floor to Chris to give you a very formal uh, welcome and then we can uh, start with our talk. Chris, on to you. Okay, okay. Okay, that was a nice chat at the beginning there. Thanks, Jess. So let's get right into the session now. All right. I hope everybody is ready for our next session on um, you know, sexual and women's health. This time, we have more spectacular speakers lined up for you. Um, I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna introduce them again. They are Sean and Steph from uh, Wonderleaf, Elaine and Joanna from Pink Flag, and of course Dr. Rebecca from Sexual Health. Yes. So I mean, yeah. Let's get the conversation back to them. Yeah, take it away, Jess. It's all back to you. All right. Thank you. Okay. We have to do formalities, you know. <laughs> viewers probably just came in right now since it's 5 p.m. So yes, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jess. Uh, I am the co-executive director for Charisma Movement and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm so glad like when they had like the topics, I think we had four sessions in these two days and I saw this topic, I was like, yes, I want to moderate it. <laughs> I don't care who you're inviting, I just like the topic. Right. Okay. So there is a seri series of question breakdown that I've prepared and um, we will, you know, slowly get into it one by one. But firstly, let us um, touch about a very um, serious matter that even happened during uh, recently. And it was mentioned by our Minister of Finance regarding period poverty. Right. So um, first question that comes into my mind is, um, does period poverty actually lead to uh, poor hygiene among girls and whether it can further complicate their female body and definitely I would like to direct this question towards um, Pink Flag, Elaine and Jovina so either one of you can answer um, Thank you Jess, I'll take the question first mm -hmm. um, As most of you already know what period poverty is, which is a lack of access to menstrual products education hygiene facilities, waste management, or like a combination of all of these at once. And us at Pink Flag, we have collectively agreed that period poverty in Malaysia is an ongoing issue and it needs to be addressed. And if you read an article by The Star this year in March, they stated that although menstruation is a natural biological function for most girls once they reach puberty, the period products are still not considered a basic necessity, which is a problem in itself. And because of this, right, the prices for these menstrual products are actually very expensive and not a lot of people can afford them, especially the B40 groups. And when this issue isn't properly addressed, it will affect many aspects of their lives, like their mental health and well-being, their overall health and their personal hygiene. And the way it affects their hygiene is by is because like they cannot afford the products that they need to stay clean. So they will turn to free of charge household unhygienic alternatives like tattered clothes, coconut husks, banana leaves, newspapers, and some would even wash their disposable pads to be reused among family members. And when these dangerous methods are applied and when it involves one's vagina, it will cause diseases like urinary tract infections as well as other health risks. Yeah, you know, speaking about, um, just want to add on, speaking about the washing pads, but I do remember in school, you know, they did tell us like, oh, um, your pads that you use is actually reusable, you can wash it and wear them back. And I'm like, are you sure? At that point, because um, I, like, as a teenager, you just got your period and I was very new in understanding my body and I was like, is this actually okay, is it proper? And for a while, I was doing that because everybody in school was doing that. And then I realized, no, I, f I feel disgusted by that habit, right? So yeah, uh, it just triggered me when you mentioned that. I was like, oh my God, school days. Okay. <laughs> and um, the next uh, topic, uh, next question regarding the same topic, peer poverty, would be, what are the few initiatives that your organization has done recently to help out period poverty in like B40 families or in any um, families in Malaysia? Um, uh, is that, or Elin? Yeah, sure. I'll take this question if that's all right. So yeah. basically, Pink Flag started out during the White Flag movement. And from that, it, it's a group of students. And we started off rather small. But after a month or so, we were approached by the Bulan sisters. 
and with their collaboration, we were able to manage to raise to 10,000 ringgit, which amounted to about 120 menstrual kits, each with two to three cycles worth of supplies. And aside from Bulan Sisters, we had also collaborated with Hunger Hertz, which helped like to distribute these kits to the beneficiaries. And currently, right now, we're on like our second phase on trying to raise up to 20,000 ringgit this time around so that we can get even more sustainable clove pads Yes, we are actually um, buying our menstrual kits from small businesses in Malaysia, if you know, so like uh, reusable cloth pad uh, and such like that. So it's a, yeah, a, fundraisers aside, um, our Instagram page, Pink Flag, is creating as many infographics for our social media pages to address period poverty in Malaysia and also in terms of general content if anyone wants to know. So that's what we have been doing. And we also, uh, as, as mentioned before, our fundraiser right now is currently progressing so if anyone wants to donate uh, feel free to donate we would love to have more donations please, please, please. wow okay that's amazing yeah. congratulations Thank on the so like much. fundraise honestly um i remember too when the whole white flag movement was going on nobody actually publicized about period poverty they were all like oh food money and all that but actually yeah, a lot true. of women were suffering from not being hygienic, hygienic during their period times, right? So, yes. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, the last question about period poverty. So, there was this statement that um, we've asked some people from the audience and this, this statement came from a group of like university students and they said that, you know, some girls face terrible period pain, uh, some even faint, like myself, during the first or the second day of their menstrual cycle. However, um, your your bosses or your even your uh, lecturers uh, think that women are weak and we're just giving excuses during that time, right? And they just that we are simply asking for a day off. Um, so in your in your own opinion, this is not regarding poverty, but it's regarding period. Um, what do you think about the statement? Like, should there be like a legal day or should there be an official medical leave given to these females who are really suffering terrible period pains? Um, I'll take the question, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, person personally, I would like to think that I have been very lucky to not have experienced very bad period pains, aside from like occasional fatigue and cold sweats. But then like, um, it cannot be the, say, the same for everyone. And as young women in our 20s now, my friends and I do talk openly about this a lot. And through these discussions, it is clear to see that not all of us do have it the same. Like some of us suffer it, suffer from period pains really badly. And considering that most of us have entered the workforce or are about to, there is the general concern on whether we would have to ask for unpaid leaves when the pain does become unbearable. And that is when the gender inequality gap in Malaysia becomes clear as due to the preconceived misconceptions that men and even some women still have about corporate and societal hierarchies that they think that women are weaker and more emotional than men just because they bleed every month and this makes women like afraid to afraid and ashamed to request for leave from their bosses because most often i mean usually their bosses are male get it so like the shame is there to us but then like um, you see that it's like a cycle. It's like you see the stigma surrounding periods causes the lack of education. And then when there is lack of education, it causes shame and shame causes fear, ultimately leading to the silencing of women. But then when you take a look at like, um, if people are sick, they ask for a leave and no one questions it. So why should a woman have to why? be questioned when they are in pain? Yeah, so exactly. that's what I think about it. Oh, I agree with you, Elaine. Honestly, um, previously, right when I used to be in school, every time my first day of my period, I will faint. Literally, I will faint. I'm not kidding you. It was so terrible. And then after seeing a doctor and all that, I was uh, prescribed some contraceptives for like a year to reduce the cramping in my ovary part there. And after a while, then yes, my period got better. But in school time, like, I couldn't attend classes for like a month, at least two days. I, I would never reach full attendance, you know. And I was that goody two shoes, always wanted to get the award, full attendance, <laughs> but I couldn't. <laughs> okay, and uh, lastly, my man, Sean. I can't help but notice you're the only male in our show today. 
<laughs> so, I would like to ask you, do you yeah, think yeah. it's a it's a shy thing for a guy to learn about the female menstrual cycle? I guess, I, I think based on my experience, because I remember I was having this conversation with Steph, I was like, because I think based on my experience, when I was in kindergarten, right, it's always the boys who hang out with the boys. And the girls yeah. hang out the girls, and then if the boy come up to you, and you know, if the girl come up to you and touch you, be like, "Ee, you touch me!" <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but for me, it's like, it's like, it's in the sense that we were already kind of segregated in the sense that boys should be you hang out with boys and girls should hang out with girls, so we don't really bother to understand what the girls are doing because for us, it's like, oh, they're just being girl. So for me, I find it is very important. It's very sadly that we don't receive enough education about. Like period poverty and about how how uh, the women's body work. Plus, I remember I was talking with Steph. I don't know if this across whole Malaysia, but I remember it, I was trying to recall to myself like when did I receive my first period like education as a guy? I'm trying to think, and I don't I don't remember like in primary school. I don't think I remember it. And then so I asked Steph because uh, I'm three years older than Steph, and we're from the same school. So I asked Steph, uh, how did you receive your period education? And she told me. Oh, I remember that the boys will be separated and the girls will be separated. And the girls will have uh, their period education and boys will do sports. I'm like, what? What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and this and this is why I don't remember having my my period education only until secondary school. Then, where you know, in the science books and everything. But I feel like at a very young age, boys should already understand how how period work because I also remember last time um, before we went for. Uh, Horror speaking competition when I was primary five, and the competition was held in an all girls school. So we had to practice there, and then I was asking the teacher, "Oh, where's the toilet?" And all the toilets are all for girls, but they they convert it to a, a guy's toilet lah. So me and my friends, all guys, very happily walking to the toilet, like very shy. E girls toilet, girls toilet, but teacher said can use. We went in right, and then suddenly right out of nowhere, my friends started screaming, "Dara, Dara, Dara!" I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> So wow. we went to the toilet and it was like blood in the toilet bowl and then we, we, were, we didn't receive any education about it so we were scared. So that's why for me, I feel like it's very important for boys to really un to be educated at an early age so they won't be scared, so they won't be like shy to ask about it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Wow. Okay, whatever you <laughs> just said, just rem reminisce yeah. my school days. <laughs> But yeah, like um, even if you you know when you talk about the theoretical books that we learn in our form three science, right? It's just theory. It just tells you how the process happens. But when your your body changes, it's not it's not covered in the book. You know that's a different thing. That's a experience talk that you know that many girls should be sh not not shy to talk about. Mm -hmm. But yeah. All right, uh, so to our audiences, if you have any question regarding period poverty or anything regarding the menstrual cycle that you are afraid to say out loud, today is your day, ask your questions. We have amazing people sharing with us today. So yes, all right, that was about period poverty. Great session. Now, let's talk about postnatal depression and blues. Okay, honestly, I've never heard of this. Um, I never knew there was such term because I have never gotten pregnant before, yes. And also because, I, I don't know, I even asked my mom when I was doing research about this, like, what is postnatal depression or blues? You know, so I'm looking forward to get educated on this. Um, maybe I can direct this question to Dr. Rebecca. Um, do you know what postnatal depression is and like what are the common sy symptoms or what happens during this stage? Like, have you came across any patients? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, postnatal depression, we also call it postpartum depression. If I don't get it wrongly, it's defined as having symptoms of depression that fulfill certain criteria within six months of uh, having delivery. That means uh, if you deliver in January, so any time from January to June, if you fulfill these three to four symptoms of depression, you're considered having postpartum depression. So essentially, the, the criteria is the same with a normal person having depression. It's just that coincidentally, it's um, the, the period after you have your delivery. So the symptoms would be almost the same with a normal person. For example, um, cannot sleep or sleep too much, um, no appetite to eat, no interest in doing normal daily activities, feeling sad all the time, 
um, crying for no reasons. These are some um, layman terms that we use, but uh, more psychologists or psychiatrists they will be able to diagnose uh, it even better. So usually for postnatal depression, it's it, it, it could be dangerous because in Malaysia, I'm sorry for the wind again. It's okay. It's ex <laughs> the wind is excited. Wow. Excited. So in Malaysia, there has been cases of mothers having postnatal uh, or postpartum depression, committing suicide. So it's uh, quite, I wouldn't say common, but it does happen. So they either kill themselves or kill the babies. Really? So it's it's something very serious. It's uncontrollable because you're having this sickness, depression. For example, when mother hears the baby cry, they feel like it's the crying of a devil or, or some something just very bad just because they couldn't cope with motherhood. Um, it's something that could be prevented uh, with it could have some, um, um, I would say, genetic elements of it uh, in the depression, but I think most of it could be prevented with proper, you know, prenatal counselling, preparation, social support by the family and husband. So yes, postpartum depression does happen. Uh, I cannot tell exactly what's the prevalence rate in Malaysia. I think I think that there will be figures about it, but yes, it's something true and does happen in the society. Wow. Okay. I, 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 I actually never really heard of this term until I started doing this research. And um, what do you say is kind of true? I think it happens to those who are rushed into motherhood or those who are didn't expect what motherhood would be like, you know, right after a few days giving birth. And it's, it's really scary. And I don't know why, like, when I speak to my friends nowadays and they all say that, oh, I, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. You know, I don't want to go through pregnancy. I don't want to sex. So scary. I want to avoid like kids' commitment. But in the end, in the future, those people become mom. And what if they go through this kind of depression, right? So, yeah, that, that was that. Th thank you, Rebecca. Um, where 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 are you working as a doctor right now? I'm now based uh, at Penang General Hospital. It's a tertiary hospital in Penang Island. So that's where I need to complete my two years of training. Oh, did you just graduate? No, I actually graduated in 2020, October. So now it's almost a year plus since I graduated. So I've been working for about five months. I see. Amazing. Okay. And um, what, what area do you want to specialize in? Is it in women health? Yes, I'm pretty interested in women health, sexual health and even public health. I'm still exploring, I would say, because I'm in my clinical um, yeah. training. But yes, I'm definitely very passionate in this view. Wow, okay, amazing. I have a few doctor friends and most of them, their answer is like, oh, I want to be a pediatrician. I love kids. I love them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, thank you. Bye. No kids. Animals first. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> then you'll be a good friend with a vet. Oh, yes. I, I I don't know. I I rather the like kids, right? I mean, they are they are great, I guess, but I'm not ready for that kind of commitment. Like I say, I'd rather be successful and have a dog beside me rather than a big family. That's just personal opinion, guys. Personal opinion. I agree. But, yeah. I agree. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right, great. I have Jovina by my side now, and my dogs. <laughs> Okay, so that's great. And now is my favorite topic of the day. You want to know what? It is called safe sex. Ooh, yes, I said the sex word, okay? Believe it or not, those who are afraid to say it, listen up. <laughs> okay, so um, today we'll just cover regarding the safe sex um, topic or window. Today we'll talk about the use of contraceptives and the most importantly, the consent to sexual activities, all right? So, um... There is the saying, and there is actually a study in Malaysia thereby we, we noticed that, you know, the poor families in Malaysia tend to get more poor. Why? Because they normally have a big family, right? And the few factors to play to it is they think that, oh, the bigger the family I build, um, the more they can go out and, you know, uh, support us. Or the other way you look about it is the lack in the sex education that's given to them or the accessibility to contraceptive that's given to them, right? So to Sean and Stephanie, um, what do you think about the statement? Is it true that, yes, there's period poverty in Malaysia, but is there also like 
uh, less contraceptives availability. Steph, you want to answer that? Huh? Okay, sure. Um, I feel like there is a var variety of like contraceptives available, but I don't think I don't. I'm pretty sure that not a lot of people have the knowledge to or like the proper knowledge to on how to access these contraceptives properly in a healthy way and what's required of their bodies and like their needs and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But is our contraceptives expensive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably that they are expensive, but it's because the government isn't doing anything to subsidize this or to like reduce the cost for it. So I was just talking to Sean about this the other day and with some of our colleagues. Sean, you want to recap what they said? So I think for us, it's basically, it's, it's always, uh, when it comes to contraceptive and uh, sexual health, it's quite, it, it takes both parties to try to solve the problem. So in, in the sense that it's, it's, we're having a lot of um, governments to work together with, with non-organizations to bring it out. But at the end of the day, it still boils down to how well is our sex education in, in Malaysia. Like if it's, there's, there's no point in having a lot of contraceptive if the sex education is not good enough or is not uh, adequate enough for people to learn. Because I think a lot of cases is that people do know about contraception. But for them, a lot of comments that sometimes we get is that, oh, I just don't want to use it because it, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel natural. But <laughs> that's not the point. The point is that contraceptive or especially condoms and it's there to protect you from STDs. And I think a lot of people they don't know what is STD. For them it's just, oh it's something I'm just gonna brush it off my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we're talking about. I agree. But going back to the part where Steph said that, you know, um, contraceptives is expensive. Is that why um, those uh, poor families can't afford them? And then when, you know, they are, when they do sexual activity, in the end, they get pregnant and they bear up so much, of course. And all their kids are, you know, suffering, no proper education and all that. So is there a way that, I don't know, there could be a government support and, you know, those families can receive free contraceptives? Hopefully. Do you think it's possible? Hopefully, right? Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. I see. I know. I, I think it's not it's not the part where it cannot be given up. You know, if, if the government wants, we can definitely partner with, you know, you guys or any other like contraceptive brand that is able to provide, right? The mm. issue is that they think contraceptive is a bad thing. Like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. cannot That's take awesome. this against our religion. Mm. Cannot mm. take That's this. Education in Malaysia is still very much abstinence for abstinence focused. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we feel like, I feel like the way that if, if you treat sex education as a touch and go subject, then people would treat it as a touch and go problem. But then they'll be like, oh, it's not at the back of my mind. That's why I feel like you're putting such an importance in other things, but you have to understand that sex is a big part of everybody's lives. Hmm. Sooner or later, you, you encounter it, you talk about it. But, and the sad thing is that if our education system cannot keep up with it because the times are changing very fast. Information is going in and out very fast. And sadly, a lot of young kids, they're getting exposed to like pornography, getting ex have, having sex talks with their friends. And if, they're, they, if they don't have proper guidance from adults to say, oh, porn is just a fantasy. It's not the real thing. It's not sex. So educate them about it. Be there with them throughout the journey because I think all of us, we went through puberty, we went through uh, yeah. We don't know what's going on in our lives, trying to find ourselves. And for me, it's like, I feel like I was blessed enough to have my mom who gave me like a cute, like sex education when I was young. There's a book about the human body and she actually sat down with me and explained to me. So the book, when, when you reach about sex education, is about these two robots and there's little people working in them and say, oh, this is where the egg cult goes to. And for me, it was a very fun experience for me because I was, it was like, oh, so this is how the human body works. So I feel like, you cannot, you cannot, how to say, um, have a lack in this because the moment you put sex education behind, the world is going to move very fast. So you have to keep up. Wow, Sean, that, that's a really good thing though. I only remember getting a period talk. 
not a sex talk. So <laughs> it was <laughs> a very sad thing. I remember like I had uh, only one friend that, uh, and he was a guy, and he said that you know his parents told him about like sex and mm. how you would be very attracted to girls and all. Then I was like, okay. Why did my parents not talk to me about it? You know, um, I think it still goes back to the part where it's a taboo to talk yeah. about this in our society. So, yeah, that that's about talking. Like, I mean, to to the other speakers out here, have you ever got a sex talk or a period talk from your parents about what happens when your hormones are alive? I actually discovered porn on my own. <laughs> At the age of six, six, yeah. Oh, wow. Because like, uh, I know I was at I like my relative's house, and they had pawn statues in their like in a cupboard or something. And me being like, you know, a curious child, I started like opening cupboards, and then I saw like a legs, a woman's legs open, and I was like, "What is this? I've never seen this before." And I stared at it for ten minutes until I heard my mom calling me. And I showed it to my mom. I said, "Mom, what is this?" Then she was like, "Oh my god, no!" Then she threw it away. And I was like, "What?" <laughs> and yeah, I never get this like stop. Now I realized it was porn. Ah, yeah. uh, so wow! That was, <laughs> that was one cabinet. All right, all right. Don't but think, it, but yeah. My understanding is that I think our parents. We cannot blame them if they are. If they, because they are not educated on this, also no, yeah. their parents didn't tell them about how to how do you talk to your kids about sex. They never had that yeah. kind of education, so I think yeah. most of the time they'll be like, okay, uh, if a, if a, just no kissing, and they're like, okay, no kissing. So I feel like parents, right? They also never receive proper sex education, so they don't know how to tell us. Like, is this yeah. what you should do? Mm. Is the issue with the revolution? I mean, like slowly, slowly we are developing and we're realizing that this should be better. I bet in the past time, so they didn't know about contraceptives. It's for them, it's like no sex. That's it until you're married, right? So yeah, yeah. Before we carry on, like further question: What is your advice to the younger generations that are so curious out there? Is it safe sex or no sex? For me, right? Okay, because um, because I, I come from a very small town. Me and Steph, we come from a very small town in Sarawak, Cebu. So it's quite traditionally minded, in the sense that a lot of parents. They always want to protect their kids. Say, oh, this is in Chinese is my bao bei, or this is my little baby. <laughs> oh, you get hurt. And but they they fail to understand is that you can shelter your kid as long as you want. But the moment they go to college, they step out to the to the outside world of their comfort zone. They're gonna get exposed to all this. Their friends are gonna be talking about sex because and that's why for me growing up, I'm I am quite lucky that my, my parents. They did tell. They did tell me like, "Oh, just be safe. The condoms are there for a reason." But imagine a person who doesn't know what was going on, who goes out there unprotected. It's like an army wouldn't send their soldiers out without being prepared, right? You go for training. So for me, I really believe is that you should train. You should slowly educate them young. So when they go out, they won't be scared. They won't do like irresponsible things. So they will be prepared. They say, "Okay, yes, um, sex is a part of life." I rather be responsible. I rather be prepared. I rather keep myself safe and keep、uh, the person involved safe as well, rather than going out and say, "Oh no, okay, sex, sex, yes, yes, yes," and then <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's the issue with many of them right now, right? They just they are so like curious. Everybody is like, "Oh my god, what is、mm. this?" Right? They want to try. It's yeah. yeah, it's it's just that not many people are thought to be safe. Rather than you know avoiding it, so yeah.、Mm. And coming to that question, the follow up is that you know you mentioned about being protected and all that. Do you think it's a responsible that only guys should be holding when like having、mm. sex? I think for me, right, it's 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 a misconception because I was reading about gender roles, and then they always talk about oh guys are being be held responsible, guys are the man of the house. But at the end of the day, right, you have to understand that sex involves Four parties. It involves a man and a woman, or what? What? Why were you? Yeah, why were you believe it as well? Yeah, but but in a sense, it involves two people, and you two of them should be responsible. Because honestly, right? Sadly enough,、uh, when me and Steph were talking about, you know, like stealthing, you know, stealthing. So like stealthing involves a guy halfway through intercourse, he would take out the condom without the girl's knowledge, and that is stealthing. So for us, is and then 
me and Steph were trying to think about how, how can we work this properly. Then we had a very um, good discussion about, it's like wearing a mask right now during our pandemic, right? You wouldn't trust, really trust a person to wear a mask to keep you protected, right? You wear your own mask, right? Yes. So that's why for us, I, we believe that the responsibility goes to both parties. Wow, okay. That, that's really amazing. Now, to the, to the ladies of our yeah. evening today, do you think it's something flattering that when the guy takes the extra step to be safe or do you think that you yourself will take the step to be safe or be ready when you're having um, sexual interactions? Anyone can. Um, so can it? <laughs> yeah. Um, personally, like, I mean, like Sean mentioned, it is a two-party thing. So I definitely agree on that. And since, like, okay, personally, I'm not sexually active. So, like, I would <laughs> I wouldn't be taking <laughs> precautions for it. But then um, it is flattering when the guy does go the extra mile to actually keep the girl safe as well. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. cool. I think about it. Okay, that's cool. That's amazing. How about the rest? Stephanie, Jovina, Rebecca? I think it doesn't that's matter really if good. you're a guy or a girl. You must always be prepared for safe sex can be prepared by carrying condoms in your purse or having them at home just in case because you never know. You never know whether the guy that's coming over to your place, whether his condoms are expired or not. Make sure that always be prepared. And being prepared means that you won't be caught in a moment without one. So yeah. as ladies, we don't, we don't need to be afraid to um, take control take control of our sexual health and safety because that's our priority. Because in the end, we suffer the consequences, STDs, pregnancies. So we have to take charge, be prepared. It's not a promiscuous thing to, to have condoms with you. Sex is a healthy part of relationships and there shouldn't be any shame or judgment associated with sex or buying condoms. Preach, exactly. preach. Exactly. <laughs> Stephanie, you just like marched a parade. <laughs> Honestly, that was really good. Charge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, you unmuted just now. Uh, what would you think about this? Yes, I think the question when we ask whether a lady would be flattered if a man carries condom, it originates from the idea that a lady is the one who is advantaged if a condom is being used. But in reality, we have to know that a condom prevents two main things. One is a sexually transmitted illness. One is pregnancy. For pregnancy, of course, it would be the lady who's getting pregnant. But for STI, it would be both parties. That means a girl or a lady who has STI can transmit uh, uh, it to a man if a barrier is not being used. So we can try to think it in a reverse order. A guy should be flattered if a lady is advocating for the use of a condom as well because the man is being protected from HIV and other STIs. So I think it's something that we need to be aware of. Everyone has the responsibility, not just because you want to protect the other, but just also to protect yourself regardless yes. of your uh, biological sex. So that's mm -hmm. something that I think it's worth remembering about. True. Yeah. Because wow. I think for me, like, STI, STI doesn't discriminate. It doesn't pick and choose, oh, I want to infect you, I want to infect you, no. <laughs> it infect both parties, so the sensible thing is both parties just have to be equally prepared. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. Honestly, I agree. Jovina, last one, what, what do you think about this? Are you flattered? The guy oh, well, I mean, if a guy thinks that he wants to uh, do the hee-hee <laughs> with me... <laughs> oh, we're still keeping? I, with, uh, with the snack with me, like, <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, I think any girl will be flattered. Like he wants to take the take the step, take the notch. Like he knows he wants to do it. Add a protection. Like hashtag wrap it before you tap it. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. It's definitely necessary. and protection for both parties is definitely like something that's needed. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. I personally, I mean, yes, I I personally feel yeah, it's flattering. Yeah. But to me, I look at it, I say, oh, okay, it's like your duty, but. Like mm. what um, Stephanie said, I carry a condom in my purse every time. Right? Ever since I've been more aware, ever since I've like, you know, been exposed, I was like, okay, I need to be safe myself. 
So this is something I practice. And when I tell my friends, they're like, dude, why? Like, seriously? And it's like, why, why, why the judgment though? It's, it's actually a very responsible thing. Yeah, Anything yeah. can happen at any time. But yeah. yeah, it goes back to the part how all these talks are taboo. You know, even yes. the most youngest of generation. Mm. So yeah. All right. That, that was about <laughs> safe sex. We'll come back to that. We have a few more questions and I bet the viewers are raging up because this talk is so hard to be openly, freely and fun and laughing like what we're having today. Woo! Okay. <laughs> um, next, um, I would like to talk about the uh, importance of uh, proper sex education in school um, during the rise up of this culture called hookup and dating apps. So if you notice during this MCU, right, um, Tinder and Bumble and all this uh, weird, weird dating apps have been sparked up. I think people are just staying home bored and lonely. So people, you know, started investigating this kind of platforms. And um, to Dr. Rebecca, why, why do you think there is such a rise in this kind of hookup culture? And is there any relation towards a poor sexual education? Uh, just now when you ask this question, I noticed the word that you used, it's proper. You asked whether the proper sex education is important in school. So yes. I just want to give some background knowledge. Actually, uh, sex education has been implemented in our syllabus a bit, a bit since the late 1980s, early 1990s. So it has been there for some time. It's just whether it's proper or not, as it is comprehensive enough or not. Um, I would say that it has already advanced a lot since the initial time where it was first implemented. The, the syllabus has gotten a lot wider compared to when it was first there, but it still has room for improvement. Um, if we follow the standard of um, international recognized um, guideline, we use the term comprehensive sexuality education to describe sex education. Um, it's an age-appropriate uh, curriculum-based curriculum. So it's um, culturally appropriate, appropriate to local culture who learns it. And um, it's comprehensive. So it involves the emotional, physical, and social part of it. So in school nowadays, uh, uh, sex education is taught in the subject of health education. So we have that, um, you know, in my times, we have pendidikan, jasmani, and kesehatan. But now they have two subjects. Pendidikan Kesehatan and Pendidikan Jasmani. So sex education will be taught in that uh, health education, Pendidikan Kesehatan subject. But um, it will be more uh, wide the syllabus as you go on. So for example, in standard three, it will be very simple. Then standard four, it has more of the biological structure um, and the process and then about periods and how to protect yourself and all. It's there, but um, it's not comprehensive yet compared to the international standards. As in, it doesn't tell you how uh, explicitly how a pregnancy happens or how sexual intercourse happens. It's like a bit, a bit lah. Want to let you know a bit, but mm. not that much. So mm. at school, it's not only the problem of syllabus. Syllabus is one, whether it's comprehensive enough or not. Second issue would be whether teachers are trained enough to teach it because teachers are at the age of our parents. So if our parents did not receive sex education when they were children, teachers are the same. They were not taught sex, edu sex education. So how do we expect them to be able to talk about it openly in the class, especially if they themselves are shy, they, they are not equipped, and they, they feel not confident because they don't have a lot of knowledge about it. So it's not only a a problem of curriculum, it's also a problem of training and resource um, and, and teaching. So there are two main problems in the school. So you also asked about whether um, TikTok uh, actually rises in the, the culture of Hukwat. I think it's, um, it's very fastened by the COVID-19 pandemic because since the pandemic, more students are using uh, online resources. So they have more access to tablets because they have to study online. But it also means that they have more time and more internet exposure and it could be unsupervised because parents can't be there all the time just to look at the children studying. So they could be exposed to a lot of wrong information online and, and uh, things like sexual grooming, um, cyber sexting. So these are very dangerous and I think we should explore more in, in this session. It's um, something that is hastened by the uh, pandemic because 
people, children are using online tablets and devices more. So they are more risky in the time of pandemic. So this could contribute to the hookup culture as well. Ah, wow. Well said, Rebecca. I, I, I never would analyze this area when you think of like the pandemic and the problems that it has caused, you know. So yeah, very well said. Actually, uh, Dr. Rebecca, what is sexual health? Like what are the areas that is covered un under sexual health? Because when, 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 I, when I hear about it or when my mm. friends talk about it, I would think like, oh, it's like being healthy, but you know, keeping your, your, or, like your female organs healthy, being hygienic. But I think it's more than that. Or maybe I'm getting it wrong. What is actually sexual health? If I were to give a very proper um, definition of sexual health, um, WHO actually has it, but it's very technical. It says it's a state of physical, emotional, and mental social well-being in relation to sexuality. So sexuality is, is um, a, a main umbrella and sexual health uh, is attained when you, you have all the parts of sexuality covered. So it includes um, um, sexual orientation, gender identities, a pleasure of having sex, free of violence, free of coercion, a freedom to express your sexual behavior, your gender. So it's a very wide compass sexual health. So because sexuality itself is a very wide compass, it involves a lot of, about your life more outside than uh, your sex life. So it's a very wide umbrella of you being able to express yourself uh, in layman terms. So that's what sexual health is. And sexuality education, like what sexual health is, is more than just teaching you to have sex. It's about how you can um, express and, and um interact, uh, have good relationship with others. So it's a very wide uh, compass in the sexual health education or sexuality education. If, yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. See, that that's what I didn't know. I didn't know that um, gender and your sexuality goes into sexual health. I always thought that it's about, you know, hygiene and stuff. I don't know why, because I haven't been told this. You see, I don't think in my schooling years either, I have not had sexual um, education. All I had was uh, Cortex, um, Laurier coming to my school, telling me about Premier <laughs> and the new pads that they have. And of course, the most common form tree science education. I swear at that time when I used to go to mission, they'd be like, oh my God, we're learning about the female body today. I'm like, okay, sure. So interesting. <laughs> so yeah, that was the only education I got. I, 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 yes. think, I think it's, it's quite interesting what Rebecca said, like especially according to WHO, like sex evolves, like it, it evolves emotions. But sadly enough, our sex education, it talks all about the technical aspects of it. How a girl, but it doesn't talk about the emotional aspects of it. And emotion plays a very important part in sex. It's a very emotional thing. But if schools don't talk about it, they don't really, if they don't address it, then like what, what, what Rebecca said about... um. There's a lot of uh, cyber sexting and everything. And a lot, of, a lot of times, people are curious. It involves emotion. They get excited. But school, that's why we will talk about school should keep up in the terms of, yes, we have, we have sex education, but they should also talk about the dangers of cyber sexting, the dangers of or what to watch out for and that, um, how to deal with your emotions when it comes to sex, what to look out for, how to do it. But I, I don't know. Do you guys think that sex education in Malaysia will ever reach that, that level? anybody would like to answer mr sean <laughs> on that part or your opinions what do you think i personally as a student i'm hoping that it changes but yeah, i don't yeah. know how well it would become so comprehensive or so understanding yeah. the most they would do is like so technical that in the end the meaning is still not to have sex abstain yeah. yourself forever yeah because for me i feel like if, if you like any other subject students will get I'm interested. The moment you say pendidikan sex, obviously they say, oh, sex, sex, but the moment they hear pendidikan, they'll be like, oh, I have to pass this subject again. I have to study this again. Ah. Then they get disinterested. Because the moment you make, because you have to understand that students are, we have so many subjects, pendidikan moral, pendidikan just, just money, everything. There's a lot of subjects already. So for them to have to study another subject, they'll be like, oh, not, 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 yes. I don't want to do it anymore. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. 
Oh wow, Elaine got a subway cup offered to her. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it too. Yeah, I was like, um, Elaine doesn't want the drink. I won. Hi. Um, it's my housemate. <laughs> oh, sorry, housemate. It's okay. <laughs> but yeah, great sharing, Sean. I think Rebecca unmuted herself just now. Yes, because Sean, when you asked whether we think Malaysia would ever achieve that um comprehensive sexuality education, I just want to share that I think um how does curriculum is created is very largely based on the acceptance of uh, our community. So in I think previously we used to call the subject sexuality, sexual and reproductive health subject, but because there was a backlash from parents mm. about the term that was being used, so there was a, a lot of slivers or, or even the name of the subject was changed because of that. So what I want to say is that um, uh, it's not only whether teachers are ready, um, the ministry is ready, it's, the school is ready, it's also whether the parents are ready to have their children being uh, exposed to that information at school. So, But I'm um, optimistic that we are already progressing a lot. Even now we are having talks like this that weren't here like, like 10 or 5 years ago. So I think we are progressing good, uh, our generation or the young uh, parents' generation are being more acceptable. So it's uh, a good uh, uh, mark, marker that we will be able to achieve um, comprehensive sexuality education sooner or later. Okay, yes, well said, Rebecca. I really hope so too, though. I hope that my grandkids, if I ever have, will have a chance to be having a freedom of knowledge on the sex education. Like, it's a bit um, frustrating how why in like the other countries such as uh, America and Australia can have freedom in this kind of education? And it's not even graded. It's not. But it's a must-take subject for them to be aware. But it's so hard to bring this kind of practice into Malaysia. So, yeah, that, that was just something that I realized. All right. Oh, I like how we're all engaging one-to-one. -one. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next area I'd like to cover for today evening, I hope our viewers are, you know, feeling really empowered and comfortable to ask your questions. Um, next, we'd like to talk about destigmatization of women's body. Now, this is another area that I've never heard before. Honestly, you see how uneducated I am until today. I'm like doing my own research and understanding. I was like, wow. I think I spent like a whole one week studying about this and then I understood myself better. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, this is our directed to Jovina and Elaine. Um, tell us actually, what is this stigmatization? Uh, I'll take this question, Jess, if it's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. So we Googled what it means, this stigmatization. And according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says it's to remove associations of shame or disgrace from the issue being discussed. So that's what okay. destigmatization means. Yes. Okay. So so uh, when you say destigmatization of female body, it's about like removing shame when females are yes. expressing about their bodies? Yes. As, I, I mean, see. as common spirit talk, something like that. Yeah. Ah, okay, could you could you share about that? Like um why why did your organization choose to also focus in that area? Like how did it come about? Okay, so from our experience from Elaine and I, we're extremely grateful that we actually grew up from an all girls school whereby like we are very like minded, but strong and empowering women and we weren't afraid to talk about it and be confident in our own skin. So from that we were less we have lesser inhibitions compared to the girls that came from co-ed schools and like because you know they had to mix around with the boys so it causes them to feel like afraid or shameful to actually express themselves about their bodies <laughs> yeah so mm. we also think it's highly important that our bodies are like not to be seen as abnormal for carrying out a normal and essential body function like period it's normal it's all all women experience this why should it be something shameful about for us to say right yeah, yeah, right. True. So, yeah true right so we also found out like from an article, the Times said something about women's bodies that I think it's very like something like it's important, whereby it says we are sexual beings, yet even in our most intimate relationships, we often don't know how to express ourselves. The examples we see around us to teach us to objectify ourselves rather than celebrate our sexuality, and we often find ourselves reacting to being sexualized 
rather than expressing our own desires. Yeah. So yeah, so which is why we're trying to raise awareness on period poverty from Pink Flag. Wow. Okay. That that's that's really that's wow. Okay. I I've never heard of this term, and even though I feel like I've been practicing this this stigmatization towards my own body, right? Uh-huh. And yeah, sure. now that you mentioned the definition, I'm like, why have I been so harsh to myself? You know, if you think about it, a lot of girls they shun their body a lot. Like they're like, oh, I'm I'm not enough. But to whose aspect are you not enough? You know, like like who is telling you you're not enough? And I I can be a very um. I would tell the truth, I've been doing that to myself as well. I'm like, oh, I'm not enough. So why why do you think that a lot of women are just unhappy with the way their body looks? I mean, in my opinion, because we grew up in like an environment whereby from before, the culture-wise was like, we expect the perfect woman. Or, you know, she needs to be this perfect figure. She needs to be healthy. She needs to carry this man's child. So I think like with that expectations for women to have, we... It, it causes ourselves like to criticize ourselves that we're not enough to you know to to be able to get onto that level. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Elaine, actually. You want to say? <laughs> yeah, Elaine, anything you want to add? Um, I also think that because personally, I do have a lot of self image issues as well, and I think that stems a lot from social media, like. It's like you go online and you see girls having nice bodies and you want it. And it's just so hard to do that <laughs> when you live in Malaysia. But then it's also a genetic thing. Like I came to know that it was also a genetic thing. Um, where like you won't necessarily get bodies that people that you want because it is like a gen- genetic thing. Like you, if you don't have the genes for that, you don't have it. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Elena. I think it is from social media. A lot of it is from social media. I like I like how direct you are, honestly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, this is something I, w- I like to share also is that um, I used to be a, a bigger size person in school. So I used to be like about 80 kilos last time. And uh, with girls is that when we are at that age of like growing, right? Uh, that time, so you're like a teenager. So you're developing your body parts, especially your hips and your chest a lot, right? And at that point, when I was losing weight, when I was fatter, my chest area was big. And when I lose weight, that's the first area that reduced, right? So it reduced so much that right now it's way smaller. And my mom looked at me and she's like, why did you do this to yourself? It's not going to look nice. I'm like, huh? To who (laughs) though? But I was like suffering with a lot of back pains and a lot of like, um, yeah, just a lot of posture issues because of that. So I had to lose it. So yeah, don't don't worry, Elaine. You're still very pretty and hot. Don't worry. (laughs) And how about Rebecca and and Stephanie? Like, do you face this? Like, do you shun your body a lot? Do you you compare yourself with your friends? Or are you just really proud and happy of who you are? Damn, you need to tell me your tips. I've never had this issue before. I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm me and I'm fine with it. I don't compare because I feel, I feel like comparing yourself with other people will just create unex, un, unnecessary like worries, anxieties, all that kind of stuff. So I, I just stay away from negative thoughts like that. Damn. Wow, Stephanie. Huh. You seem like yeah, a very I mean, cool I mean. <laughs> Wow. Stephanie, this is interesting, Stephanie. Wow. Okay, that's cool. I, I'm really proud. I'm really proud that you're happy with yourself. That's really amazing. I think very many people like us, we suffer, like we struggle from reaching that stage that you're in. So congratulations. <laughs> and how about you, Dr. Rebecca? Have you faced like that before? Or are you like Stephanie too? Yeah, just call me Rebecca, by the way. <laughs> um, for me, I think I... I don't have it now, but I think I was more um, aware about my body image when I was in um, secondary, or, or secondary school that, uh, or near to college because at that time I had uh, some acne problem. So that was when I was more self-conscious um, and, and to compare myself to others who seem to have a perfect skin. 
But that happened a few years ago. And after I graduated, I went out to college uh, from high school. I went out to college and even to university. I became the uh, quite an extreme version where I don't really care uh, how people think of me. That that's uh, not good sometimes as well because you don't dress up enough uh, or dress up formally enough for some occasions because of lack of. Um, of being too ignorant about your after appearance. Mm -hmm. So it's something that fluctuates throughout my life. And I think having some level of um, um, self-consciousness about your body image is good as in you want to appear good and you're confident, you, you just want to look good, not in a sense where it leads to negative consequences where you feel inferior or, or you feel stressed out because you're comparing yourself. So that's a, a point where I think people need to balance, including myself. Wow. Huh. Yeah, that, that's actually kind of true though. I think many people in like school ages do that. They suffer when they're in school because they're surrounded with like many of the same peers. And then when they leave, they either become more extreme or they just become ignorant, right? So yeah. And also, um, Jovina, I wanted to ask, what, what, does, um, what do you think about those like um, females who are like extra masculine and they, they want to be like bodybuilders and all and they get shunned? for that, if the old females are not supposed to be like that. Is it also under the stigmatization? I think it should be under the stigmatization because it's basically shaming that a woman should look a certain way. If you yeah. want to get masculine, it's your own body. It's like I said, your body, your choice. You live how you want to live your life. If you're happy with it, you live with it. Because it's honestly like there's a few, uh, I have like a one female friend that use that likes to be masculine. So she she dresses up in a masculine way and and no one complains about it which i'm happy about but then sometimes she gets insecure about whether people will judge her for it and i think it she shouldn't be judged it's not something that should be wrong right yeah true i yeah. agree yes I what I think. <laughs> thank you all right that's good it's like one hour into our talk how are you guys feeling so far can i get a thumbs up yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, just just a few more areas before we you know see the questions that our public has for us. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting question that I actually forgot to ask just now when we're talking about safe sex. Um, so to both Sean and Stephanie, um, is consent still needed for married couples? Yes. Mm, yes. yes. Consent is necessary <laughs> for any sexual relationship, even if it's casual, committed long-term commitment or even short-term commitment is needed your marriage license doesn't mean that your marriage license does not mean that your wife or your husband is just waving his bodily autonomy autonomy away you still have a right to say yes or no and then you have to make sure that consent is always enthusiastic really given informed and reversible specific yeah Fries, F R I E S, fries. Just remember, mm. consent is fries. Freely huh? given, R reversible, I informed, E enthusiastic, and S specific. Wow, okay. <laughs> to our audience, remember it's fries, okay? Fries. If your boyfriend or husband asks you consent, tell them, analyze the fries. Mm. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, marriage is all about respect. And you have to respect each other's bodies. Doesn't mean that. When you marry, they, I think people take out the take it out of context when oh, when you marry, you become one. So your body is my body, my body is your body. It's not it's not like that. You still have to respect each other boundary. And then like what what Steph is said, I think the most interesting is people forget that consent is reversible. If a, a, a person might say yes initially, maybe because they want to please the other person, but halfway they feel uncomfortable, they'll be like oh I don't want anymore. And then the other person will be like eh, but you want or oh. you want it or oh. that, that's that's not consent anymore. It's basically, it's just like me, okay, if, if I borrow, Steph, if I borrow your car, I say, okay, I borrow your car, you say, okay, and then you pass me the key and I drive it for one day, and then next week, I just take your car without asking you, and then and then you'll be like, eh, I didn't say, okay, or I, I can say, but the first time you say, okay, or, you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? Yes, yeah. yes. So, that's why I, that people tend to forget that consent is reversible, and at any time you can say no, and any time you have to respect that. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the one part where, like, our staff mentioned was that, you know, even when you're married, you still have the rights to say no. But many people forget that. They think that when they're married, that, oh, okay, whatever my husband wants, I have to give. Whatever my wife wants, I have to give. 
Because that's what they think the marriage cert is, right? See, and yeah. this is why a lot of like younger generation are afraid of marriage. They're yeah. excited yeah. to be in a relationship, but they don't want to reach to the marriage level because of all these other things they have to think about. Yeah. So, yeah. Plus, yeah, yeah, plus that's it. Marriage is not a license for sex. Marriage is a, 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 it's a commitment between both parties saying that, yes, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you. And in terms of, I'm going to respect you, you're going to respect me, you're going to live a happy life, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I agree on that, honestly. Uh, anyways, <laughs> every time I hear all these married talks, I'm just there like, oh God, do I yeah. want to go into it? Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's so stressing. It, yeah. Mom, when are you going to get married? I say, I cannot even take care of myself. How am I supposed to take care of another person? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like a lot of areas are, you know, to be measured before you actually say yes to that person, you know. And please take your time to analyze the person before you actually say yes. Because once you do and then things get worse, it's not to say you can't turn back, but it's just like harder or like, that, that, that's just in my opinion, not right? Yeah. That's why I always say to my friends, you know, if you want to stay with that guy, just make sure you test him to all the levels. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it, 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 interestingly enough, um, me and Seth were reading, we're trying because we're also trying to say like what happens if marital rape does happen in a marriage. What I think it, it has happened, right? In Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of cases, but I think a lot of people, I mean like even for me, I only just recently found out that they're they are not um okay, I'm reading from uh, this article, Ask Legal, and they said in okay. Malaysia the definition of rape can, can be found in section three seven five of the penal code. So say a man is said to commit rape who accept in the case of herein after expected as sexual intercourse with a woman under circumstances falling under any of the following description. So they talk about the description talks about uh, a man is said to commit rape when he has sexual intercourse with a woman against her will without her consent, putting her in fear. It also covers statutory rape, sex with someone 16 years and below. And then they say, interestingly, interestingly enough, if you read through the entire list, of section 375, you may notice that the, the only reference to man and woman, which you would think includes um, husband and wife. However, it doesn't because they say it doesn't because of the exception to section 375. The exception is sexual intercourse by a man with his own wife by marriage, which is valid under any written law for the time being enforced or is recognized in Malaysia as a valid, is not rape. So in a sense, and then we, we were having a discussion and I was, because it's, it's a, quite a complicated issue, right? And then we'll say, like, I, I guess, but there's another law, it's a domestic abuse law that protects a uh, married spouse from, from all this because it says any man who during the, sub, the okay, this is uh, under section 375A, which reads any man who during the subsistence of a valid married, marriage causes hurt or fear of death or hurt his wife or any other person in order to have sexual intercourse with his wife shall be punished with the imprisonment term which may extend up for five years. And I think it's because it's it's hard it's, it's hard to prove rape in a marriage because in the law it says that mar like sex is it's okay in a marriage. So maybe yeah. this is why there's another law saying that if your husband or your wife try to hurt you physically, then you are charged under that law. Because we were saying, that, oh, how is this? How is marriage rape not not like illegal in Malaysia? Then we realized that maybe it's because it's hard to prove in court, but it's easier to prove the, like being abused in a in a marriage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I was. I realized as well because I was in this um women program once, and we were talking about like what what issues we can raise up for like women's, and we noticed that in the Domestic Violence Act they mentioned marital rape. And I was like, why isn't that under the sexual part? You know, why is it under domestic violence? Because mm. domestic violence is so big. It could be so many things. And, you know, and then I realized that what you say, it makes sense. Mm. It's harder because of the consent issue. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Thank you for sharing about that. Yeah. I just realized about that too, like this year when I joined that mm. program. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Just now, earlier the day, earlier of our talk time, um, I hope our audience remember a few of our speakers talk about the proper roles of a parent and child, talking about sex talk and, you know, development of like proper adulthood sex life, right? So, mm. should uh, parents in you know, Malaysia actually make this practice? 
should it make a habit to educate their kids about sex? And if yes, what age do you think is more appropriate? This is open to everybody. If I may, I think, I think yes. if, if not parents, then who? If you understand, because parents, we are, they are there to, to guide us through life. Yeah. And I feel like, that's why I said, I'm really thankful that my mom did actually sit down with me and talk about it. But my dad was still very quiet. My dad never talks about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like, I, I mean, like if, if I was a parent, I would definitely take the time to slowly talk to my kids about it. Obviously, I won't say, oh, this is sex to a five-year-old, right? Like, well, this is what <laughs> yeah, you have to like slowly implement it, slowly guide them through it. So I guess you just, you just have to follow the natural progression of their lives. Yeah, true, true. Actually, before you answer that question, um, another question I would like you to answer is that, do you think our parents, I'm saying our, I'm putting myself at your ages, okay, I'm very young too. <laughs> do you think our parents <laughs> are uh, ready to give that kind of talk or are they themselves educated enough to give us that talk? Mm, pardon? Uh, do you think our parents are themselves educated enough to give us that sex talk? No. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. I feel it's just that, like, like what we said earlier, is because their parents never taught them. And maybe, I guess that's why I think now, since we all of us are aware of this, then maybe we can break, take, take the next step. Yeah. Educate our kids. True, true. Yeah. How about others? My four other ladies of tonight. What do y'all think? Who would like to go next? Me, if I may share. Oh, yes, Rebecca. <laughs> yes, uh, I was thinking when you ask whether parents are the best person to teach um, um, sex education to children, I would say yes to, because um, most uh, sex education are delivered by two main roles. It's either parents or teachers. But in Malaysia, because uh, our society, the community has different um, moral values in, in different families. So, so in in sex education, it's more culturally appropriate uh, or even more confident uh, uh, by parents to teach because they can then instill their own family value in the children when they teach sex education. Teachers will of course be worried to teach sex education because they will be accused of wrong things if, if it's, it's somewhere gone wrong. For example, they are accused of um, um, encouraging sex uh, by teaching contraception even though we know it's not true. Uh, but for parents, they have uh, control over it. So if they are to teach uh, contraception, for example, they can teach something extra, for example, oh, you can use this, but I'm here to tell you that um, in our family, we encourage A, B, and C, uh, but uh, we want to let you know that uh, it's best to be A, B, C, but um, if one day you, you, you still meet these uh, circumstances, you can use contraception. So it's an example where parents can instill their own family value when they teach um, uh, sex education to children so that it remains appropriate to their own family culture as well. So mm -hmm. I would say that parents is the best figure to teach. And about age, actually for comprehensive sexuality education, there is no definite uh, age. It's never too young or too old. So for example, now you're a young parent, you realize, oh, your child is already 10 years old. Is it too late for me to start talking about it? Or it's already 15, is it too late? Or the, the baby is only five years old, not baby, sorry. The, the child is only five years old, is it too early? So there's no too late or too early. It starts, in fact, the syllabus starts at three. So at the age of three until the age of 18. So what you do is you expose more information at the time. For example, a three or a three years old asks you, oh, where does baby come from? You can just answer simply, oh, it comes from the mother's uh, abdomen, somewhere there. If a five years old asks you, you may say, oh, it comes from the uterus. Uh, okay, you can draw it uh, in, the, in the abdomen, there's a uterus, baby lives there. If a seven years old asks you, you can ask, how come the baby goes into it? You can try to explain how sperm goes in. In a nine year old, you can explain how sperms go in through the penis, which is inserted into a vagina. So what you do is there's never a good age to talk about every aspect of sex education, for example, how reproduction happens. It's just exposing information in a more greater, in a greater depth at the time, according to the age. 
So I would like to encourage parents who um, we said they didn't know how to teach because they weren't taught about it. Use resources as much as possible because there are a lot of videos, YouTube videos, or even books that we can use um, to, to teach our children about it. So it's available on YouTube, on, on just the, everywhere in the internet. You can just search like um, resources for parents to teach sex education uh, and the age nine years old, for example. You can always find resources and it's never too late to start talking about it. That's amazing. You know, when you mentioned about where do babies come from, a little sharing from my side. So when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, okay, I'm the youngest kid, by the way, so I didn't have any uh, younger siblings to, you know, see my mom belly boom. So I asked my mom, how did I come out? You know, how did I, how was I born? And she's like, oh, mommy and papa kissed. Wow, you kissed and I'm here. <laughs> And that's how I found out. Okay, and I went and tell my friends, like a happy kid. I'm like, oh my god, my parents kissed and I'm here. What is a kiss? I don't know, but they kissed. <laughs> and you know, at, at that point, and then when I was going out, I discovered about sex, and I was like, that this is this is rubbish. That, that is not how you have a kid. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's actually pretty important to tell them. Uh, not everybody gets to, you know, uh, see younger siblings like me i'm a younger child i would never know how my mom got pregnant right unless i ask her those who are the elder siblings they saw like oh you know my mom got a bigger stomach how and all that you see then they start asking you see so yeah there's just a small sharing it triggered me <laughs> a lot of childhood triggers i'm getting today <laughs> okay how about the rest uh jovina stephanie elaine what do you think uh, well, I'll answer first if that's okay. Oh yeah, sure. So, so before I answer the question, Jess, I also had like experience like you. I'm also the youngest child in my family, and I asked the same question to my parents, but it was a different response. Oh, <laughs> they told me that they found me in a dustbin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I was sad for the whole day. I was, I was, I'm, not, I'm adopted. Like you took me from the dustbin. I was like, but. It was a it was rubbish. I mean, yes. the husband is rubbish, but yeah, <laughs> the story That's was just rubbish. family humor. That's just family yeah. humor. <laughs> All right. So regarding the question, well, I don't think it's um proper like for the parents to teach a child on sex because what Rebecca said just now, I find it like it's such a good idea to teach from young, no matter the age, like step by step. Like it's such a good idea in my opinion. And moreover, mm -hmm. like um since I since. I think us, like our parents, we don't really have like a sexual relationship kind of talk with them. Uh, I think it would be better because it creates a safe space in a sense. Like if I do conduct like sexual practices and I find problems when I'm like, you know, doing it and I can't talk to anyone about it. If I ask my friends, they're in the same lane as me. Like we don't have much education on it. But if I have a safe space with my parents, perhaps they have done it because I'm the product. <laughs> then... <laughs> that i can you know they're able to educate me on it so yeah that's what i think that it's such a good thing like if a parent can teach their child about sex good that, that, that's great jovina and do you think there's a special age to it um i uh, i don't think so like you can just learn at any age but this just depends on the answer on how you portray it like what uh rebecca said rebecca just said. now yeah cool cool all right lastly elaine and stephanie what do you all think uh, actually i agree with what joanna said about providing a safe space for children to ask because like i am in a very similar boat with joanna in terms of like we didn't get the sex talk at all um the only thing my mom told me when i reached a certain age was don't get pregnant <laughs> that was the only thing she told me so like um in terms of age i think like rebecca said it's the slow implementation and then it's just creating a safe space where the child will feel comfortable enough to actually approach their parents to ask about it without having to feel shame or fear that their parents will like scold them for having sex, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And Stephanie, what do you think? Yeah, by, I think by having all these like open and honest conversations with your parents, like children, they won't feel they are less likely to feel that pressure to become sexually active before like they're actually emotionally ready. And like, um, yeah, I feel like for younger kids, even talking about sex, you can also talk about consent. Like if your child is at the age um, in between two or four, 
and then i mean you can like tell them like your body is your own like no one's allowed to touch your body especially strangers strangers like don't touch your genitals all that kind of stuff and you shouldn't you shouldn't touch your friends private parts as well mm -hmm. she, she's like at that age teach them about boundaries not letting strangers touch you inappropriate all that kind of stuff i think it's very important and it's also very important to also talk about the pleasures of sex if while you're educating your child about the risk let them know that you know sex can be wonderful in a loving and committed relationship yeah yeah and it, the role of parents in like educating like children about safe sex is very important like so important like everyday moments are key like teachable moments are everywhere like for example if there's a um, family member that's pregnant you can talk about how a baby develops inside a woman's body or if there's an advertisement about sanitary pads you can use that as a springboard to talk about periods yeah yeah wow okay yeah that's amazing yeah. so like I was definitely said you don't need to be a professor to teach your kids you just need to use whatever resources you have and your experience to tell your kids at any age so yeah that, that, that that's amazing and another thing i wanted to ask like would you all be comfortable to tell your parents if you've ever like you know had a sexual intercourse if huh I'm not asking whether the like if <laughs> Maybe, maybe three years ago, or maybe five years ago, I wouldn't talk about it. But maybe like now, yeah, with my mom. Ah, that's nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, she, at that stage, she knows like, okay, you're going to do it sooner or later. <laughs> you might as well be honest with me. Not hiding wow. okay, make, sure make sure you're safe. Damn, Stephanie. That's really nice. Always so confident in your side. <laughs> How about others? Would you all tell your parents if you ever encounter? Ah, uh, Sean, why are you squinting? I just don't know how to start. Like, hey, mom, yeah. I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> you can buy a birthday cake. I, had, I just had sex and give it as a cake. <laughs> I guess, I guess I guess I just don't have that the uh, openness with my parents. Hey, I just okay. don't know where to start. Relatable, relatable. <laughs> so Jovina is going to give a cake to her parents yes. once she has done it. Peekaboo! My daughter has reached here. Another milestone in life. <laughs> How about Elaine and Rebecca? Um, for me, I think it was implied when I started dating. <laughs> I think like she sort of knew anyway. <laughs> Hence the don't get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> now I know how that statement came about. I'm like, why why would the parent be so direct, don't get pregnant? Now we know. <laughs> and lastly, Rebecca, would you be comfortable enough? I think when that happens, it definitely um, needs some proper approach to open up the topic because um, it's not something so so uh, prevalent in my family as well. It's not like, oh, mom, I had dinner, I had fish just now. It's, <laughs> it's a different topic, just like how um, I think that the main thing would be being opportunistic uh, like how uh, parents would teach their children uh, opportunistic learning, we can use it reversibly as well, uh, find opportunity to talk about it. And and when there's indication or indicated to talk about it, because if not, it will just be no upward, oh, I had fish yesterday, then so what? <laughs> so if, if there's something more to it, oh, I had fish yesterday, but I I ate the bone accidentally, something, something to talk more <laughs> about it. <laughs> then I think it would be a good opening. Ah, okay, that's a very good example. Fish. So we have fish, we have cake. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Even like, uh, if you ask me, I would probably be more acceptable to share with them now, but I don't know, it's still, it's still like fear. There's like fear in me to approach them and like or how to tell them about it. 
But I see that I'm getting closer to my mom and she knows that I have this kind of, you know, wouldn't say aura, but just this wild side that one day I'm going to explore something like that. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Lastly, before we go to the public uh, questions is that this is also open to everybody. So in the main context of Taboo Health, which is our conference all about, in this uh, two days and since we're in the last uh, session of the day so in asian countries it is such a forbidden thing to casually talk about sex right um even you can see it in malaysia and in the context of like spreading awareness or just or just educating those who are at age however in the western countries it's such a common practice that sex education is even given to primary kids right so in your opinion why is it such a taboo in malaysia or um even in any asia country and when do you think we'll ever make this a norm that you could just walk in a pharmacy and like ask for condoms or easily without feeling like you're having slight judgment from the lady behind the counter. <laughs> Anybody can uh, take the floor first. Oh, do you like to be called? Okay, then let's hear it from. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, nobody's starting. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, somebody unmute. Oh, Stephanie, you unmuted. Okay. I think it's still, it's mostly a taboo in like societies where like comprehensive sex education is still something to be implemented. And also where there's like a long history of religion attempting to control people's lives and sexual behavior, especially in regards to women. And then so they control that by telling people, by making people think that sex is dirty and that virginity and purity is the entire worth or value of a woman that, or, or that a divorced woman is like secondhand or menstruation is dirty. But I, I believe that we are progressing every day. That we're having talks like this right now. And we, when we are educated on stuff like this, our children, I mean, not our children, our future, the future generation will also be better equipped with information like this. They would know how to access um, uh, contraceptives, all that kind of stuff to protect themselves, to prioritize their sexual health and to know their sexual rights. Cool. Yes, I agree. I agree. Thank you, Stephanie. I always get these positive vibes from you. You're such a positive girl. Positive. I don't know, attitude positive, everything positive. Thank you, Stephanie. You have spread your positivity to me today. <laughs> uh, how about you, Elaine? We're just going to go according since uh, nobody wants to volunteer. Um, for me, right, I think that it's still a very taboo thing because, like, personally, I think that I was, like, brought up thinking that um, my genital parts were, like, I guess you could say sacred, but not really sacred. But you just have to like take care of it in like a don't simply like let people right. in on that kind of stuff, that kind of thing. And so like with that mindset, you when you reach puberty, it's like you will feel ashamed to even think about like having like sexual thoughts or like even want to talk about it. Like even with friends, it was quite hard. Like even though Joanna and I are from like all girls school, it did, it was like until upper sec, did we become more comfortable actually talking about it? Yeah, and in terms of when, like, it will become a more normal thing to talk about, like Stephanie said, we are, like, progressing. So, um, for now, it's a good start that we are actually talking about it now. And we can only hope that it gets better from here. Yeah, true, true. What, what, what all good school were you from? Um, Infant Jesus Convent Malacca. Oh, you're from Malacca? Wow. Yeah. That name speaks a lot of holiness. <laughs> Explain why. <laughs> uh, do we know what about Maybe a holy school, but we ain't holy enough, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> after you leave the school. After you after, leave. After, after, after. Before after. that, we were angels. Yeah, yeah, we were very good in school. <laughs> <laughs> or you were taught to be, you know. <laughs> and how about you, Jovina? What do you think? Uh, well, it's definitely a taboo because from in Malacca, I feel like we were quite a conservative society. Like even with relatives, we weren't really like allowed to talk about sex. And 
coming from it, I felt like it was because like from before our parents' generation or perhaps our grandparents' generation, it was a big taboo. And because of that, the influence, it came on to us. And here we are like, you know, we've been quiet about it. But right now we're having this talk and I feel so grateful. Like, you know, we're reaching out. We're being more open about it. We're being more forward. We're, we're moving past from the traditional mindset. And here we are today. And for in terms of how long for us to be able to make this a norm, perhaps with our generation, it could be a first start because right now we're having this. And with our future generation, it could be much better. So yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Nice, nice. <laughs> Thanks, Jovina. <laughs> and what about you, Rebecca? Sean, I'll keep you for the last, Sean. You know, since you're the only guy, I got, I got another special question for you. I'll keep you last. <laughs> so what about you, Rebecca? Um, if we were to say when we can, you know, openly buy condom without being shy and all, I would ask then why, how, when would the children be able to take out their period pads from their back without feeling shy? Because I remember in school, uh, girls, even even two girls, I used to hide my uh, pads, not in my pockets when I needed to go to the toilet, not showing anyone. So I think it's all in the same umbrella of sexuality. It, period, sex, um, even talking about emotions, generals. So once we start talking about conversation in this umbrella, so, so not necessarily about sex, but about emotions, about relationships, about uh, our roles, about gender equality, when we talk more about this, it will open up a space that is um, safer to talk about sex as well. So all this must go um, in the same uh, line so that uh, it, it won't happen just because uh, suddenly, oh, people are open about talking about sex. It's a whole umbrella that we need to address, the whole umbrella of sexuality and sex education. True. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for the insight. Thank you. And lastly, we have the one and only Sean, the man. Uh, <laughs> so, Sean, what do you think about it? And additionally, Sean, what would you like to tell to the boys out there, you know? Do you tell any message to tell them to, like, you know, learn about the sexuality and I don't know, learn about female health and all that. What what message would you like to give? Me? I think I think also you can answer the first question first. Okay, yeah, I, I I think in all things we are progressing because, like I said, information is sharing very fast, and I think a lot of kids, I me mean, especially my friends, even though their parents don't share with them about sex education, they're going to learn it online. They're going to research about it themselves. So I think for me is that at the end of the day, just make sure that you are keeping up with whatever our future kids are doing. Don't, don't, don't feel like, oh, they're just kids. I don't care about what they're doing, but it's important. Like I said, I think I've been stressing in the beginning that it's very important to be there with your kids throughout their natural progression in life. And that, and like, like what everybody's been saying, our generation now is we are slowly opening up. As you can see, I don't think my, my great grandfather ever taught about, to my grandfather about this, but that's why for me, I was quite, happy that my mom shared with me. So it, it shows that it's, it's progressing and hopefully mm. in the future that all of us can just be happy to talk about it because it is important. It's a part of every part of our lives. And going to your second question, I think guys should put away a lot of their egos and take time to understand what is going on in your, in not, not just your girlfriend's world, but especially your mom, your grandma, Take time to understand because at the end of the day, we're all living in this world together. We're all trying to make this world a better place. And it's unfair that women are being left out. It's unfair that women are being mistreated because everybody is working together. So I feel like guys should really just put their egos away, put everything away and just say, um, share with me what's up. <laughs> exactly. Yay! Thank you, Sean. Woo. Thank you, everybody, for your sharing. All right, now I'll, I will allow my uh, tech team to just share the screen for whatever public questions we have. Hi, team. What's up? Oh, there we go. Oh, eh, wow. Eh. Oh, 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 wow. My team is so responsive. Yeah. Oh, my God. We have quite a number. Okay. Didn't think that we would have quite a number. <laughs> Okay, so anybody can just um, unmute yourself and answer, yeah? So, wow, I like the second one. Uh, this is very interesting. Do you think BDSM, fetishes and such are considered to be healthy sex? 
anyone? I think um, for me, it's this, it, it all boils down to consent and how both parties are accepting of it. Because uh, what is um, healthy sex? Because sex is, dif- uh, sex is viewed differently by other people. Because I remember I was watching this video. It's a very, you know, those random Facebook videos that you, you, you stumble across. And I was yeah. talking about this girl who acts like a cat in front of her boyfriend or something. And, and then the, comment, the comments are saying that, wait, this is, this is really bad. Like, oh, uh, you shouldn't, the girl, the girl shouldn't put herself in that position. But in the video, they explain that this is how both of them make, make each other feel happy. This is what they like. And for me, when I was thinking, because I was so judgmental, I was like, yeah, you're not supposed to put yourself in that position. But at the end of the day, for me, it's like, if both of them are happy and they're not hurting one another, if none of them is being emotionally abused or like even mentally abused, then that's their life, right? Then we, yeah. should, we shouldn't judge them. We should be happy that they found common interests. So that's going back to the topic of BDSM. As long as it's consensual, as long as nobody's getting like mentally or emotionally hurt and they're both happy about it, they're both okay with it, then who are we to judge them? Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, Sean. Thank you. Right, <laughs> next. Next question is, um, I think this is uh, more directed towards Pink Flag. It is uh, regarding the censorship of women bodies. What are your opinions about the free the nipple movement? Should it be acceptable in Malaysia? I support this movement so much. Just personal opinion. <laughs> so, uh, Elaine or Jovina, would you like to take this question? Uh, I'll start first. Okay. Um, personally, I definitely support this movement. I think bras are constricting. Yes. And <laughs> I think women should generally be able to like wear whatever they want. So why should we... And they should be able to post whatever they want without having to censor their body. But because it is normal and... If you can see it on porn, why can't you see it on other people's social media? <laughs> like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> okay. exactly. Do you have anything to add on, Joanna? Uh, well, definitely 100% support this movement. Like, honestly, bras are so constricting. And even more, the white bras, my goodness, oh, they I hurt so oh, bad when the white yeah. comes out. Oh. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, like uh, like Elaine said, it's definitely the girl's body. It's what she wants to wear. Why should we be sexualized for having nipples? Guys have nipples. Why should we be, you know, like, oh my gosh, her nipples can be seen. The guy's wearing a t-shirt. I can see his nipples very clearly. There's nothing wrong with it. And I 100% yes. It, in Malaysia-wise, yes, it should be acceptable. Like, why shouldn't it be? It's just that, you know, with the mindset of, like, other people, they are very judgy. They think, oh, you know, she she mustn't wear it like that. And it's obviously, like, you know, wrong of them to do that. So, yes, that's what I think. Yep, yep. Cool. Thanks, Jovina. I actually support that part where bras are just annoying completely. They cost a lot and they hurt a lot. And, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'd rather not wear one. But, yes, <laughs> thank you for the sharing. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to the next question now. The next question, I actually would like to change it a part. Like, um, just, just modify a bit of it. Uh, I would like to ask this to Rebecca and it's about sexuality. So, uh, do you think the trend of um, this pronounces that uh, every platform is having she, her, they, them, he, him and uh, most of these people um, are openly expressing themselves, their sexuality on Instagram. Do you think it's a good thing for um, sex education or do you think that it is sending a different type of message? I think adding a gender pronoun uh, to your title or your name is it's actually a movement or an action to be inclusive of the LGBTQ community. Um, usually we, we put it because, you know, uh, when we meet someone online, we don't know what they prefer to have their gender pronoun. It's because we don't know them in person. So we may see them as a biological female, but they recognize themselves as a gender male, which would be he instead of a she. So that's why um, uh, having a gender pronoun is important. But even if your um, biological sex does match your um, gender pronoun, you may still want to consider using a gender pronoun on your profile because it just uh, shows an act of being inclusive of having a gender pronoun. So it's an act of 
uh, inclusivity, I would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and does it affect anything to do with the um, sex education? Like, I don't know, do they get different education or like how, how? Does it affect at all or not at all? Or is the whole complete different thing? I think having a gender pronoun, it just uh, creates more awareness about uh, what gender is because not everyone know what uh, what is the difference between biological sex, gender, or even sexual orientation. Uh, three of these can be totally different and could be the same. So, so um, having a gender pronoun um, may make people be more curious. I even searched about it when I first saw people using pronoun. So it tends to create more awareness and, and let more people be aware about this uh, different entities. So it's a good thing and I think it's part of uh, sex education as well because when we put this, we're educating people that oh, there's such thing as uh, having a gender pronoun. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Just uh, maybe like two more questions we shall take. Okay. So next we have is, um, do you think sex ed thought in school is influenced by religious beliefs and restrictions? Who would like to take the floor? How about Stephanie? Stephanie seems very positive. Do you think you want to answer this question? <laughs> Yes, definitely. It, oh. Everyone everyone deserves to be educated about sexual your sexual health. And then um just because you have a religion doesn't mean that you should overlook that part of your that part of you. You still like children, students still still need to need to be taught about STDs, unplanned pregnancies, how to have safe sex. Even even when they get married next time. They must know all, all these important aspects of taking care of your sexual health. True, true, true. You, um, okay. like, schools, like schools shouldn't like hide or conceal certain things to just for them to be abstinent. Mm. Everything should be like everyone has the right to know what what's going on what's going on within their own bodies so this should definitely be a right for them to get comprehensive sex education if i may add to that yeah i would also like to add that um actually i don't think there's a conflict between um religion and sex education because essentially sex education teach you all the things uh, that are factual and um, everyone, despite having the same sex education syllabus, they still have the right of them to make the decision. So, so it's about empowering people or, or children with um, decision-making capacity. So I know this is A is right, B is wrong. Uh, so, okay, I know A is A, B is B, but whether I want to do it or not, it's based on my family value, my culture, my religion. It, there is no conflict in getting that knowledge and um, the really, uh, religion perception of it because the decision-making um, part is still on me. It doesn't mean that uh, I know this can be done, then I must do it. It's something that I would like to share. Agreed, agreed. Thank you. Thank you so much for the sharing. Okay, next question. Um, we have actually two of the same. I can combine it and ask. Um, it's about promiscuity. So uh, I think Sean, you can take this question. So it says that why when a man is promiscuous, it's fine. But when a woman, it is not and she's slut shame. Is it true? I, I guess, like like I said, going back, it's just traditionally, I really think it's toxic to do toxic masculinity in the sense that um, men men are just being men. Men are there to pro- procreate. Men are there to, to you know, like be, be, the, be the bread bread provider and everything. And I think that's really bad because it's like like i said um sex doesn't discriminate every everybody everybody feels the same and i think the most important is that we need to change that we need to stop thinking that or oh, it's or like for like if, if a man if a guy sleeps with or uh, like a lot of girls to be like oh yeah yeah he's a star you know he's yeah good and if a, if a girl's do it to be like Ugh. We, we we have to we have to stop that because it's so toxic it's too, it's very toxic for everybody around us not just for for women but for men as well because you are implementing a very toxic thought in a guy saying that i am a man and i don't have to respect a girl she's a slut mm. blah, blah, blah. 
And that's going to be devastating for, for kids, for young boys who are taught at a very young age that we should disregard a, a, a woman's sexual health because they are, they, are, they are sluts and we are men. So you're going to ruin a, 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 a generation. You're going to ruin a lot of, a, a lot of lives. Lah. And for me, I think the most important thing is that we need to be taught to, to, to keep safe, to keep protected. I think that's one of the most important things. True, true. Well said, well said. Does, does anybody would like to add on this statement whereby women are easily slut shame and men apparently get away with it? Have you ever heard of men slut shamed? No. <laughs> Never. Oh my god, that guy is yeah. not wearing a shirt. He's a slut. Yeah, why, 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 why is his nipples out? Yeah. <laughs> I've, <saying> heard, <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard like, you know, girls, oh my gosh, she not wearing a bra, she's walking out like that. Mm. Ah, gone, gone, gone. Ah, mom will yeah, come yeah, out yeah. with a sleeper. <laughs> so yeah, mm. anybody else would like to add on it or shall we move on to the next question? All right, move on to the next question. <laughs> you guys are a funny bunch. Okay, um, the next one is very interesting. Uh, why do you think masturbation is a taboo? And do you think it's healthy to masturbate? Anybody can take this. How about Elaine? Hi, Elaine. <laughs> um, hello. Um, the reason I think that it's a taboo is again, I think it's the internalized misogyny. It's like because like growing up, like when I have guy friends from an all boys school. I will hear them talking about like their shared masturbation story <laughs> and I'm just there like what? Like it's so common for them to talk about it but in all honesty my friends and I didn't really talk about masturbation until we were well into like college time. Like that's for girls like we felt more comfortable talking about it when we like realized that we were doing it <laughs> and not like just a guy thing. And personally, I do think that it's very healthy to do it. Yeah, hmm. masturbating Actually, is very yeah. healthy. I feel that not many women know that masturbation is also for them. And they feel like, yeah. oh, we, we cannot do something like this. It's not good for us. But um, it uh, to me, like, I believe that masturbation allows you to understand what your body likes. So when you do tr like, try out yeah. your sexual activity with a guy or a girl not judging uh you know you understand what your body wants and both of you can enjoy like you know a good time together that that's how i see masturbation yeah, yeah. it's very good for getting to know your own genitals because i still have some girlfriends who are afraid of like their own genitals even at this age so yeah yeah True, true, true. And and sometimes i feel like when i speak to my friends who are in a relationship and they say like oh you know um my boyfriend can't please me uh, or like I, I, I've never reached that, that stage, you know, where I'm like fully uh, happy in my sexual intercourse. And I'm like, have you discovered your body? Like, do you tell him what you like and all that? And I don't think it's a practice among couples in Malaysia, especially like to share what you like. Because as it goes back to the whole circle, how sex talk is a taboo. So, you know, it's, yeah, to me, I think it's important that, that you share. All right, next, uh, let's go. Um, wow, this is very nice. I like this one. Why is rape always thought as from a guy to girl, but never from a girl to guy? Actually, there have been news that girls have, like, I saw a news, I think it happened this year. Early this year or middle this year, whereby a girl raped a guy. And in Malaysia. Yeah, so that was pretty interesting. So, so what do the others think? Like, have you heard of girl raping guys or, you know, yeah, this statement? Anybody would like to answer? Dang, 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 dang. Jovina, it's your turn. Put you on spotlight. <laughs> Hello. All right. So I did hear about like a girl raping guys. Like I think it was in America, if I'm not mistaken, like two girls raped a guy and then they kept him locked in the room or something. I'm not sure on the entire story. But but yeah, but the reason why it's always thought of a guy from a girl is because like I think in statistically, like most guys have done the rape on girls and it's even caused women to feel scared like okay would as for girls right would you dare to walk a night in an alleyway alone 
unsafe for us to walk. Right, it's so, unsafe yeah. for us. Yeah, like as a guy, like I'm sure Sean, if you were to walk in an alley at night, would you feel as scared as you were? I guess okay, that's, that's a very interesting thing because right. like for me, I I'll definitely feel scared. I'll definitely yeah. feel scared of walking in the alley alone, not because uh thought, oh I'm gonna get raped, but rather yes. I'm gonna yeah. get stabbed or like robbed. So yeah. that's why I think like, as I think well, because I remember my, my friend she was sharing with me, she said girls even before they leave their house, they're already being judged. They're already being watched. She was telling me that and then I think at that moment it hit me, I was like, Whoa, I never had that worry before. I never had to worry about what I'm gonna wear, what I'm gonna do. But in, in, in answering the question also, like, it's, it's quite sad that, that that even when guys get, like, the cases of guys getting raped, it's, it's not taken as seriously. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, saying, yeah. Oh, he yeah, probably yeah. likes it anyways. Yeah. Oh, a guy is stronger than a girl. How come he don't want to fight back? Sometimes it's not about that. Guys are not, not all guys are like, mm, like that. Some guys are quite as if they, that's, that's just who they are. And sometimes they guys can be mentally abused as well. Mm. Can be mentally manipulated, and you talk about the guy being locked up, like that could happen to any guy. It's not just, like I said. Don't let your ego take like, oh, I won't get raped. You could get raped by <laughs> the like I said. The world is a very, very bad place. Yeah, of bad people. That's why, like, I think people should just be understanding and say, okay, there is a risk of for, for you. I'm going to be there for you if you need any help. Help everybody. Just don't overlook. Uh, That's what true. I need yeah well said actually yeah if you think about it the issue of girl you think a guy has not been um, given headlights or given mm -hmm. um, proper investigation to just be like oh this happened yeah. you know but um, when a guy does it to a girl oh it's a big thing I, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's, it's yeah. wrong but you know it's yeah oh wow Sean you have a you have a fan Sean just say <laughs> I love how Sean is on this discussion. He's the bomb. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sean, did you type this yourself? It's no, my hands are here. <laughs> but yeah, so we have we have a fan here. Wow. Okay. Was this Stephanie? Did Stephanie type this? Stephanie? You, you type this. <laughs> <laughs> she will never type good things about me. I'm just joking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, everybody loves Sean now. I think because he's the only guy here, so he got the spotlight. It's okay, girls. You're still amazing. <laughs> okay, um, now, going on to the next question is, um, in what way can sex ed in Malaysia curriculum be improved? Um, I'll actually like to hear this from Rebecca first. Um, I think as I said just now, it's a multi-dimensional problem. It's uh, the, it, we can say that it's sex ed should be provided by the school, so it's the school's responsibility. But uh, there are many factors that affect how sex ed is delivered in school, not only uh, the school, but also the students, the parents, and uh, of course the teachers. So there are many ways we can improve. Uh, first, in terms of the syllabus, uh, we can gradually improve the syllabus by making it more comprehensive. Uh, it's already improving, we can further improve it. Um, secondly, the teachers can be trained, they can be provided with more resources and um, less judgment from the parents. So as uh, we need to empower the teachers or parents, we need to let the teachers know, okay, we trust you, we need to communicate with them. I trust you to teach my children about sex education. The teachers need to get um, recognition or rather training from the employer, which is the Ministry of Education as well, so that they know how to deliver this topic that's regarded as sensitive by parents. Um, also, children, uh, parents can do a lot as well. Parents can prepare their children to attend uh, sex education in school because, you know, uh, many teachers, when they want to teach sex education in class, the children are just super excited. Oh, They'll be keep screening because they, they are just shy and they don't know how to react when teachers want to open up topics like this. So if parents already open a bit of the topic at home, they won't feel like, oh, it's something uh, very shy, something that I should feel shy about. So they will react better when children are uh, just teach it in the class. So that, uh, I would say many people can play many roles in improving sex education curriculum in the school. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about uh, time, effort, and also the focus of the policy. True, true. Um, pulling up to this question, right? If sex ed were to taught in school, 
Um, who do you think is responsible in framing the the contents? I, uh, I think we already have, you know, like um, for each subject, we have a um, department in the Ministry of Education that that we call the, I think something like a curriculum development yeah. um, department. Yeah. So so they are already responsible of um, taking in charge of creating the curriculum. And I'm sure they uh, do it based on a lot of international and national guidelines mm -hmm. on what to include. It's just a, a matter of uh, readiness to, to further expand it in terms of uh, like manpower teachers, in terms of uh, acceptance of the society. So those are the people who are responsible. And of course, they could also use the help of experts like, you know, sexuality educator or even those who, who are more experienced that the experts would be able to give advice or consultation on how to do it. So I think uh, they, they are already doing well and uh, it's about time that we give a more support to them uh, so that they could further enhance the syllabus. Well said, well said. How about others? Would you like to add on that? Like who do you think is the, I don't know, the correct one or the responsible one that would frame the sex ad for our schools in Malaysia? Anybody would like to answer? Nobody, so I call name. <laughs> Ile, how about you? Um, I don't know honestly, why. I'm actually not very clear on all these like legal framework and policy <laughs> things, but I think a good choice would be to have legit doctors planning the syllabus. Like, that would be a safer route, I think. Yes, I agree. Yeah. We should all suggest Rebecca to go and help them build the proper framework. Yes, go ahead, I think it's uh, it's about having, a, like what Elaine said, a multidisciplinary team. So, uh, input from everyone is important, not only doctors, because doctors know a lot about the biological thing, I would say, but not other aspects, because sexuality is really wide. So, it's good. It's It would be good if you no know, teachers are involved sexual rights ad advocator, uh, women's mm. rights advocator, NGOs in Malaysia, just all the uh, people who, who are involved in the umbrella should be involved uh, experts. True, and also psychologists. You know. I just have yeah. one question. Yeah. Cool. Do you guys think that parents right now should be re-given re sex education? Like they should go for, they should go for a sex edu education class. This is not how to educate their own kids. <laughs> I've personally think so honestly i would like to go to the class with my parents <laughs> take them with me and like hi let's go <laughs> yeah th th that's for me like, because i feel like um it's not only that they can be able to teach their kids but also it's it opens a different bond of relationship because then you are comfortable to share anything with them and in a case where something goes wrong in your sexual activity you need their support you need them to be by your side to handle whatever you're going through so yeah, for me, it's that. It's also a bond between you and your parents that not many of us are free to have, you know, in that point of view. <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that's finally. Okay, so before we wrap up and say ta-ta goodbye and I will cry because it was such a good session. <laughs> Any last words for our viewers today from anybody? Please laugh. At least for this part, you can <laughs> volunteer yourself. I think, I think for, for, for me, for I think for us at Wonderleaf is also that we want to encourage you to be open about staying protected, about protecting yourself and really ensuring that people around you also know the importance of safe sex and to openly talk about your problems that you're facing. Like if, like if my friend has an STD or STI, I would definitely be there and say, oh, what do you need help with? Like, um, there are there are there are pamphlets and booklets on this because I think people are just very scared of getting judged and I think the world needs less judgment and more 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 taking more time to help the person out and education. Okay. Yeah, Rebecca, the teachers or the educators' role to educate is also us. Educate your friends, educate your little brother, your little sister, your little cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Stay protected. I I agree. I agree. Yeah. Guys, go check out Wonder Leaf, guys. They created the unisex yeah. condom that I was so impressed. Like, even though I'm not having any sexual activity, I just want to buy it to see how it looks. 
You can yeah, buy, get it in Shopee right now. We're available in Shopee and on our website. Wow, guys, they're on Shopee. 12, 12 is coming, so be prepared. There's 10 percent off all, on all our condoms. Come oh, wow. It got a discount, huh? Hmm. So for the couples out there, if you want to have any Christmas plans, do <laughs> get yourself some one that you I mean, I, I think if, 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 okay, I don't have a girlfriend, but if my girlfriend gave me condom, I'd be like, oh, you care about my protection. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, so we're giving you ideas for Valentine's, you know, so next year, <laughs> our, our viewers will have better gifts. <laughs> okay, uh, next, um, maybe, Elaine, you unmuted just now. Um, I'm not going to give any advice since uh, Sean covered most of it, but... We just, I just want to say again, Pink Flag is still having their second phase donations. I mean, we are still receiving donations. Um, you can go over to our Instagram page for more information and the bank details are all there. So please help out Thank some you. underprivileged people. Yay! Congrats, guys. They raised 10,000 previously, guys. Let's help them raise more. Aim to 20, aim to 30. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Everybody should be bleeding comfortably wherever mm -hmm. they are. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, how about Stephanie? Any positive vibes from you? Oh, the alarm here is ringing. Okay, maybe her positivity, you know, spread to the alarm as well. Okay, <laughs> next, Rebecca, how about you? Uh, I just want to encourage all of us here um, the fact that you're here today to, to listen to this, to share your opinions. At uh, even the audience here to listen to this, it's it's an encouraging act that um, people are getting more interested in topics like this, just like, you know, have to boost our topic today. Um, you can make a difference. Start talking about it little by little, like Sean said to your relatives and when you are parents to your child, you can make a difference. And, and if you think there's so much lackings in the education system, sex education, you can change it. You can actually start giving sex education on your own. It's not hard. Um, resources are all everywhere in the internet. So go for it, guys. Wow. Thanks, Rebecca. That's amazing. <laughs> and last but not least, my girl, Joina. What do you want to say? Well, from all our talk here, I think it's been such a great like discussion that we've been having. You know, even from women's body to even sexual health, we learned a lot. And I feel like whoever is watching us, I hope you're able to, you know, get more information. I'm sure Jess has learned a lot, right? <laughs> yes, a lot. I also have learned a lot. I'm not gonna lie, I've learned a lot. So yes, everyone out there, do like be who you are. Do not be afraid to be who you are. Like I said. Also for sexual health hashtag wrap it before you tap it. All right, be safe. Let's let's keep the fries going. Let's keep the yes. rapid before you tap it going. All the hashtags today, <laughs> spam. You may tag sexual health. My uh, yes, you may tag pink flag. You may tag Wonder Leaf. Just tag everybody and do check out their Instagram, guys. Go find out about their organization and see how we can be a part of or help out. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much to all five of you for our talk today. Uh, I hope that I have made your session fun and it's been an honor to be your moderator for today and I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Um, I will invite my MC, Chrisada, to join back so that I can take a picture. He's been raving about you guys. I bet he's been laughing <laughs> behind the screen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the jokes aside, like everything you guys have discussed is absolutely superb. Like, like you probably won't hear this anywhere else you know you won't you won't hear this topic being um you know being uh, you know talked about so openly so i just want to say thank you so much you know jess and the speakers for that Chris. wonderful discussion on uh, yes so, sorry you want to say, uh, yeah. I, I have a question i have a question were you the one that uh, uh typed about sean in the slido just now okay don't listen, don't listen. Don't listen, don't listen. <laughs> start, start, start. Now, now live stream so <clears throat> Now live stream. Uh, okay. Behind, behind, uh, behind stage. Backstage later. <laughs> backstage behind the curtains. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Should yeah. So, a... you know, I mean, um, I'm just giving some closing remarks about. Like, I mean, I have my personal thoughts on what whatever you, guys, whatever you guys have just said. Also, like, I think one like if, if there were like a few things to take away from this whole two-hour discussion is number one, fries, consent. That's very very important. 
So next time anybody goes to McDonald's or KFC, look at the fries. Remind yourself what F R I E S means. Very very important. Uh, then yeah, like the other topics that you guys also talked about, like you know, like masturbation, sex sex ed, fetishes, rape, like these kind of things are very very taboo in our community. And I'm so glad that you know this event has gone full circle in you know debunking and taking a deeper dive into these health taboos. And I feel like you know we have really reached the objective and the target of our this event, which is to ultimately you know break it, break up, break the ice, and give to the public what is actually going on. You know these taboos; they are actually not taboos, and they are meant to be talked about and discussed about. So yeah, that's really really great. I just want to thank you all one more time for that wonderful wonderful session. Um, so I think we'll be going on to the next segment of our event now. Which is, of course, another round of lucky draw. Oh, there wow. it is. All right. So this time again, let's get the names into the generator. Let me put them in right now. All right. Let me see. Do the speakers right. get a chance? I mean, it's random. So <laughs> it's up to the computer, not up to me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so okay, let's get the names in. All right. Okay. Wow. We got lost people for this session. Wow. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. It's it's generating. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's spinning. All right. Hey, we have another set of lucky draw winners. And good news to you know those who are watching. You guys, you know the ones who won the lucky draw for this final round, will be going home. 50 ringgit Shopee vouchers each. And as uh, as you know, Sean said, Wonder if it's on Shopee. Yes, check it out. Wonder, use your use your use your voucher. <laughs> exactly. 50 ringgit. I, I believe it's more than enough. You know, you can use your voucher to get some, you know, high quality mm -hmm. unisex condoms for this yeah, Christmas yeah. to give to your partner or perhaps your best friends. Mm -hmm. As you as uh, you know, as Joina has said, wrap it before you tap it. Yes. <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, just to bring this event full circle, um, yeah, again, I'd like to thank everyone very much for their active participation and engagement in this uh, symposium. I hope you have enjoyed the program and we look forward to seeing you in future Charisma Movement events as well. Um, that's a wrap for No Hold Backs Charisma Movement's first ever virtual health forum. Thank you. Yay. Yay! Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, let's just wait till we off the live. All right, smiling.